Welcome everyone to our Pork Bridge session today. Today our presenter is Dale Ricker. Dale is a Swine Program Specialist with The Ohio State University Extension. He has a statewide swine position headquartered in Atwa, which is in Putnam County, and has been in this position since 1997. Currently, Dale is an ex officio board member of the Ohio Pork Council, state trainer for the Pork Quality Assurance Plus certification program, and has completed numerous site assessments associated with the program, and is a transport quality assurance advisor. He's the coordinator for swine ventilation system workshops in the state, and also coordinates the Ohio Pork Congress Professional Pork Producer Symposium, Ohio Swine Health Symposium, and the Ohio State University Junior Swine Day. Dale has been involved with Porkbridge since 2005, when it was developed by Mike Brum and Don Levis as a pilot program, and later evolved into the program we have today. Today, Dale will be talking to us about sights, sounds, and smells of a normal finisher barn. With that, Dale, I hand things over to you. Well, thanks, Sarah, and, and thank you, Sherry, too, for, for all that you do for Pork Bridge as well as Sow Bridge. Uh, your efforts are, are certainly appreciated by us all. Um, <clears throat> as we go ahead and get started here, <clears throat> if you go off of that initial slide uh, to uh, the slide there with my mugshot, uh, and it says sights, sounds, and smells of a normal finisher barn. You'll notice there that my contact information, my email, and my office phone number are listed there if you ever wish to uh, uh, contact me at, at some point after, after the presentation. Uh, let's go to <clears throat> slide two, <clears throat> what is normal? And, and that can actually can vary. Um, but if we go to a, a definition, uh, it, we see there that first bullet point, conforming to a standard, usual, typical, <clears throat> or expected. And using that standard and uh, trying to establish your own standard for your barns and in terms of what you expect on a daily, uh, a daily walkthrough, uh, in terms of, you know, what, what's going to be going on in there, what those pigs look like, how they're acting, and a lot of those um, are written into our SOPs or our standard operating procedures, and we'll, we'll visit more uh, about those as we go through the presentation. So let's, let's go ahead and advance to slide three, uh, and we talk about setting the standard. And I break that down into sights, sounds, and smells, and I'm not going to review each one of these on this particular slide, but, you know, we look at pig comfort and water consumption and whether they've got feed or not, in terms of the equipment and water flow rate, we're going to cover that all as we go through the presentation. Uh, and so I, I think it, you know, it breaks down to, to looking at each of these as we go through the presentation. And then, of course, uh, sounds, uh, pigs and motors and fans. We get to the environment. We'll talk some about gases and air quality uh, and, and where we expect to be in, in those regards. So let's move on then to slide four. And if you notice the, the green <clears throat> slide is, I pulled this directly from uh, our version 3.0 PQA uh, producer certification presentation. And <clears throat> when we talk about daily observations and, and uh, recording uh, in written form uh, from our standard operating procedures, daily observation of animals, environment, and equipment, and, and really, this presentation, you know, falls right down into that in terms of um, having a site assessment, making observations, not only on a daily basis, but then what also we look at when we do a site assessment. And so, uh, should be understood then uh, by uh, anyone that has that responsibility to walk through the barn and evaluate animals, environment, and equipment. So, the next slide then, I have as slide five. And we start to look at daily barn walks and where our focus should be. And again, we look at pigs, environment, and equipment. But the big question becomes, you know, how much time does it take to do that walk? And uh, I break it down. We have a lot of 2,400-head uh, wean-to-finish barns in Ohio. And, and so I, I kind of use that as, as part of my rule of thumb and, and uh, to spend uh, two seconds per pig. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of time to make a full evaluation, but, but yet uh, when we have our eyes trained and, and we're focused on what we're looking for, uh, that seems to be adequate time. And in fact, when I, 
was putting this together, I quizzed a few uh, 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 growers uh, that had uh, 2,400 head barns, uh, and they basically said they could do their morning walkthrough uh, uh, in about an hour. And so if you break that down and do the math, that's about 1.3 seconds per pig. But they were also quick to point out that they kind of use Saturday uh, morning maybe as their catch-up time if they need to make feeder adjustments, uh, water flow rates, or any of those kind of things uh, that, that they made note of during the week uh, but weren't monumental and taken care of right at that moment. And then we're also talking about an evening walkthrough, so we're getting through there twice a day. Uh, and that evening walkthrough can simply be uh, check water feed and ventilation and maybe accomplish that in about 30 minutes in a barn of that size. So, slide six. Uh, my favorite cartoon, and we use this some with our ventilation workshops because it's a, it's a good point to make when we're making observations. And so if you see in the cartoon, the, the pilot says to the co-pilot, say, what's the mountain goat doing way up here in the cloud bank? Well, they see the mountain goat. They made the observation, but they didn't come to the correct conclusion, did they? Uh, and so a disaster is about to happen. And sometimes I think when we do our walkthroughs uh, of our barns, uh, we're maybe, you know, daydreaming a little bit or focused on the things we've got to get done uh, on, a, on the daily basis, uh, or, or maybe it might be the, the kids' ball game that's going to be tonight, and you're focused on that, and you're not really thinking uh, about what you're seeing. So let's go to slide seven and talk about uh, observations and developing a systematic approach. Uh, and so, in other words, do a routine, or make a routine of, of you know, checking feed, water, air, and then also pig care. Uh, if we've got pigs that need care in the morning uh, and we're trying to get out of there in an hour, uh, we do need to take care of those, uh, make sure they get some treatment uh, before, we, uh, before we go on our way. And again, here it mentions uh, that we're doing this uh, twice a day in terms of getting in there and, and looking at pigs. The more time we can dedicate, I think, you know, our records will reflect it uh, in terms of calls and death loss, uh, things of that nature, even feed efficiency uh, can be impacted just by adjusting those feeders and getting the job done right. So let's go to um, slide eight. <clears throat> and it says, uh, there were no dead pigs this morning, true or false? Well, I would say, you know, possibly true, depending on, uh, obviously, there's been some time since the walkthrough was made. Uh, that pig hasn't been, uh, you know, deceased for that long. And so I would say that could probably be true. And so the reason that this becomes important is that on a PQA site assessment form, uh, and that number is actually, uh, on the form it's number 53 on that long checklist of doing the site assessment, the question is asked, are dead animals removed from the living space upon identification? And in this case, you could go ahead and answer yes, because on a packer audit, uh, it does say if it appears the pig died since the last barn walk, uh, they still uh, receive the points. Uh, and so that would be uh, acceptable. doesn't look good, but it's acceptable. Let's go to slide nine. And then at the top again, not as easy to read, uh, there were no dead pigs this morning, true or false, and the red arrow points to the rather large bloated pig. And I would say that's probably false. And so we were, uh, we had the mountain goat in the sky syndrome when we were going through the barn that morning and we missed him. Or maybe we neglected not to get in every pen. Uh, granted, uh, when pigs get this size, it's not any fun to walk the pens. They're right there, ready to chew on your boots and coveralls and, and, and just to be a nuisance. Uh, but really to evaluate those pigs, to see whether they can walk and, and evaluate gut fill, we really need, you know, to be able to get them up. And I do caution people, uh, when we have people go through barns and they're doing it by themselves, that, you know, they, they do need to be in good health. Uh, that they're able to walk, and because if you go down in a pen with pigs this size, uh, you need to be able to get right back up, uh, or we have really, really bad results. Slide 10 is next. Observations. Uh, as we get ready uh, to develop our systematic approach, I think a, a good place to begin, uh, if possible, and you know, all these barns could be different, uh, but if we've got a viewing window, uh, to just take a look through that window before entering the barn. Uh, just to assess pig comfort, uh, view how they're laying, where they're laying. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, comfort and pigs that aren't comfortable here in a little bit. But 
And then again, as we enter the barn, uh, slowly and quietly uh, to not disturb the pigs. Uh, it gives us a better opportunity, I think, to evaluate air quality, any odors, to get a good feel for humidity. But once we slam the door uh, and the pigs jump up, you know, then all bets are off. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of commotion. They're wanting to know what's going on. And so we didn't really catch them then at that resting state in terms of to really evaluate comfort. And then as we enter the pens, um, you know, to inspect each pig from nose to tail and top to bottom uh, and to make that determination whether they're normal or not normal. Uh, and then, you know, what, what we really need to carry along with us, uh, whether it be a marking stick or a paint stick of some kind, maybe a pencil and a notepad. Uh, I, I know of some that might even carry a tool belt with some extra supplies. Now this this is one point, I, I guess, at the end of the presentation, if if as we go through this and there are things that, that you do that you find helpful uh, and you want to add at the end, uh, you know, we're all on here to learn, uh, and, and let's share those things at the end uh, if you've got something to add. I, I'd really appreciate that. We can make this a learning experience from, for, for all of us and, and from different perspectives. So let's go to slide 11. And uh, here, uh, what are the pigs telling us? I, I think for the most part, uh, these pigs are telling us, uh, hey, we're comfortable. Um, you know, we're uh, taking advantage here of our body heat. Uh, we're lying next to each other, maybe some of those kind of head and flank. Uh, and, that, and that's acceptable in my opinion. Uh, they're, they're a comfortable uh, group of pigs. Slide 12. Um, not so comfortable. Uh, they're not the clearest pictures, but yet... Uh, I think we can see more of those pigs are not lying on their side. They're kind of lying on their bellies trying to conserve their heat uh, and would be indicating to me that it, it could be a little cooler, maybe even a little damper uh, in this barn uh, than what would be termed ideal. And so some various pictures there. Uh, certainly not overly populated with pigs uh, in these pictures, um, but, but pigs that are not comfortable for one reason or another. So when we go into the barn... We need to start our evaluation to figure out why they're not comfortable. Take some temperatures, maybe check some humidity. We'll get a little further into that here in a little bit. Um, next slide is 13. Shed some light on the subject. I know I've, I've been in some finishers that, you know, have a few years uh, uh, since they've uh, been opened up, uh, 10, 12 years, and, and uh, after visiting, uh, with a, a, one of our builders with some of the new barns that are going up. I think we do have a lot better light and the opportunity for better light as uh, we move to LED lighting. It's now become pretty popular with our newer buildings. Um, they're using the LED 15 watt bulbs, uh, obviously in the globes, uh, and, and globes need to be cleaned to be getting, you know, uh, good light from that. But, but, you know, just having the light to be able to see pigs and evaluate them uh, for their well-being uh, is, is critical, especially as we get to this time of year, probably out there potentially doing chores uh, when it's not much of a daylight out yet. Uh, you know, gosh, isn't much light in Ohio now until after 7.30 in the morning. And, and so we need to have lights on probably morning and evening here before long when we're doing chores. So that 15-watt bulb, uh, from an energy saving standpoint, is going to be about $6 per bulb per year, and that's based on just two hours per day of usage at $0.11 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. Now, that may vary on your farm, but those are a little pricey, and I think it scares some people away. But when you realize your energy savings, uh, we're, going to, we're going to recoup that pretty fast. So slide 14, <clears throat> just a shot of some really uh, attentive-looking pigs. Uh, those pigs are active, they're alert, uh, and, and they're feeling good. Uh, and and that, those aren't the ones we need to worry about. It's, it's where we fall in between uh, of being a little bit on the listless side, of that type of thing. But, but those are healthy pigs, and, and we expect that out of them, to be attentive and alert and to come up to the gates and say hello to us and greet us as we crawl into the pen, unfortunately. <laughs> so moving on to slide 15, um, look where the pigs are laying. Uh, in this particular picture, uh, we have a pig along the wall where, you know, the rest of them are either attentive and looking at us uh, or they're up and moving around. And, and so, uh, you know, we need to raise a red flag on this guy and, and, you know, potentially make sure that we get in there, not potentially, but make sure we get in there uh, and, and get him up uh, and see what his issues might be. Um, moving on then to um, slide 16, 
obvious signs of problems and, and hopefully we're we're focused enough uh, to for sure find the ones that are coughing to be able to listen and hear that uh, looseness or wetness diarrhea uh, from behind and on the slats uh, lameness and swollen joints uh, those pigs are going to have to be up and moving to be able to, to evaluate that uh, and then <clears throat> you know head tilt paddling <clears throat> you know signs of strep uh, skin lesions tail biting ears flank all of those vices that it could potentially cause us problems uh, we need to be uh, alert to and aware of and making note of them. Slide 17, <clears throat> we come back to tail injuries and, and uh, you know, we've had presentations on tail biting in the past and, and I've, got, I've got two web links here. One, uh, Doug Richards there, uh, there in, in Canada, uh, it has a, a, an article there on uh, tail biting and, and uh, some of the reasons and causes of that. That was reviewed uh, as recently as January of 2016. And then uh, Mark Whitney, when he was with the University of Minnesota, gave a Pork Bridge presentation, and, and there's kind of a summary of that uh, at the web address there on the pig site. And, and so, that's, you know, it's a, it's a detailed thing in terms of what we need to be looking at, and we almost need to develop a checklist and go down the line uh, to determine uh, where we might be going wrong at with a, a vice of tail biting within our finishers. So with that said, uh, let's go to slide 18 and <clears throat> get into some of those uh, less obvious signs of a poor doing pig. Um, just being able to tell whether pigs have been eating. Oftentimes, by the time we're able to tell that <clears throat> they don't have the, the gut fill, uh, they're starting to get gant, uh, they may have been off feed for, for 24 hours or even more before we're picking that up. So it's important for us to be evaluating that uh, each and every day. Um, a rough hair coat <clears throat> um, kind of develops over time uh, and, and so uh, it's kind of a natural progression and sometimes there's other issues there that, that are making that happen. Um, but just to be able to differentiate between what's normal there and what's not normal, we've got some pictures here in the slides that are coming up. Uh, backbone starting to show or the head hanging or hunched or, or in an abnormal position. So slide 19, <clears throat> looking at our top yellow arrow, um, the pig is empty. And, and the reason and the, the way we know that is if we really look at, at their, how their hips in this pig would be more pronounced uh, and it's showing that the pig is empty. Uh, the pig just becomes flatter sided. His belly's not rounded out near as much as, as the, the pig that's there at the bottom arrow that is more full and his belly's more rounded out and his hips are less pronounced. So the, the key indicator there, uh, if we're not able to really determine gut fill from looking at the stomach, would be to look at hips on the pig uh, and then down towards the flank region. So let's go to slide, <clears throat> excuse me, slide 20. And, and just looking at normal skin and hair. Um, these uh, smaller pigs here, uh, you know, the hair should be down flat and smooth against the body. Really, you should hardly be able to see hair, especially on smaller pigs, uh, and, and it should be shiny to some degree. Now, there'll be some variation maybe with, with feed rations and whatnot, but, but uh, those smaller pigs, uh, that hair should be reasonably shiny and, and pretty slick and, and fine. So if we move to <clears throat> slide 21, we've got, we've got older pigs here. Uh, I thought a good, a good photo of, of again, a really short uh, kind of shiny hair. Uh, well-doing pigs, uh, and, and uh, just uh, it, even though they're older and the hair might be a little longer, it's still flat, it's still smooth, uh, and it's still shiny. <clears throat> Next slide is 22, and, and here we've got a, a picture of a pig with a, a rough hair coat, uh, and, and you can kind of kind of see that uh, it, it's just a little coarser looking, it's longer, it's kind of rough and, and, and duller in appearance, it's not shiny, <clears throat> and, and usually there's you know, there's other factors uh, uh, that are, are, you know, going on here. Uh, a pig that may be off feed somewhat, somewhat uh, you know, fighting an infection, uh, what have you, uh, that, that gets them to this point. But, but it is a red flag that we need to realize and ask ourselves why and what can we do about it. Parasites, infections, um, nutritional deficiencies can be part of those answers. Hopefully we've all got a place where we can put disadvantaged pigs 
uh, sometimes we call them hospital pens, special needs pens, those, those pens where we can pull pigs uh, to help them recover. Uh, and we need to evaluate those pigs uh, <clears throat> on a daily basis. Um, and it needs to be a warm and draft-free area where the floor is dry. And we need to ask ourselves as we look at those pigs each day, can all these pigs get up, can they walk, and can they get to feed and water? Because if they can't, <clears throat> it kind of falls under our definition of a willful act of abuse. <clears throat> and on a Packer audit, uh, that would be an automatic failure. And so we have failed to properly euthanize or timely euthanize. So <clears throat> with that, um, we always need to be evaluating not only those pigs, but do we have other pigs that are candidates for euthanasia uh, that we need to take care of or someone needs to take care of. We move on here to slide 24, <clears throat> and we look at eyes. Um, those on the left, um, you know, uh, pretty good shape. Eyes are very clear, uh, no tear stains, and quite the opposite of those pigs on the right. And, and here again, uh, this can result from health or, or even environmental conditions, higher levels of ammonia, uh, poor ventilation, poor air quality, uh, and then uh, obviously then to the health challenges as I mentioned before. <clears throat> so slide 25. Uh, we move on to uh, equipment and environment. And uh, I've got a whole listing of things here that as we go through the presentation, uh, we'll kind of cover each of these. So I'm not going to spend time to, to read them each here individually, but it's kind of the whole group of things we're going to look at here in environment and equipment. <clears throat> we might ask, uh, what temperature should the barn be to be ideal? Well, my answer is it depends. Uh, and it does uh, because... Uh, uh, of pig size, of zone heat, or do we not have zone heat but have mats, just mats, or do we have just concrete slats? What size are the pigs? And it's all going to come into play uh, what, you know, temperature we need to have our barn at. Now, these resources are out there available. I know uh, there are some uh, wean finish uh, manuals where we have that information. There are some feed companies that have that information. Uh, I apologize for not putting anything on the slide to, that you can resource, um, but those are out there, and if we need to, I can get those to you. Um, going to the next slide on 27, we talk about <clears throat> temperature, uh, humidity, and airspeed. Um, we can kind of get a feel for it um, just uh, you know, by walking in the room and telling whether it's hot or cold. Uh, we can get a sense for humidity. Um, a little tougher for airspeed because you know, typically from the aisle or even in the pens, we maybe don't really get a feel for a lot of air movement sometimes. But our infrared, our infrared thermometers are, are, I think, really pretty, pretty ideal for a lot of the things that we want to measure temperature on uh, in a hog barn. Um, you know, we can measure even surface temperature of a pig. Uh, we can measure floor temperature, mat temperature. Uh, we can measure the temperature of fan motors. Uh, and, and so it's really a, a neat tool. Uh, and I think uh, you may not need to carry it with you every day, but I would have it handy uh, because I think there are a number of times we might have a question in our mind and we can get an answer by using that thermometer. The anemometer, uh, the other instrument laying there to the right in the picture, uh, and uh, these vary in terms of what they'll all do for us, but I use an example here of one that can measure airspeed, temperature, and humidity, and we can purchase one of those uh, that'll do all three for around $150. And so, to me, again, a valuable tool um, to help us determine environment uh, and, and uh, have the ideal or the normal environment for those pigs. Slide uh, 28, uh, those gases and odors. Uh, you know, ammonia here, I think, is our big one, and we'll just, let's just focus on that. But uh, the bottom right there, uh, I use a, a Sensodyne pump and tubes. Um, and they're a little bit pricey, uh, but yet that can be cleaned up, and I don't have to worry about recalibrating it. Uh, there are passive tubes that we can use. A lot of those go on a time-weighted average, uh, so you're going to have to have them in there for at least an hour. But there's just a staining effect to the, to the filament in there, uh, and that's going to give us our parts per million of ammonia. On a site assessment, we do not want over 25 parts per million on ammonia, and that's fairly high. So the two web addresses here, I think, are both good ones. Um, uh, the first one deals with uh, pit gases, dangers, and selection of monitors to measure them. The second one, uh, this lists the gases in various concentration levels in terms of being acceptable uh, to dangerous, and that's, that's important, too, to know. Next slide is 29. We talk about humidity. Uh, there was a slide that said 
you know, below 65%. Uh, and uh, here, uh, one that we've used in our ventilation presentation, and I really don't know what the source of this is, uh, our optimum uh, zone here in terms of fighting back, you know, bacteria and the viruses from taking hold, uh, 40 uh, to 60% relative humidity becomes ideal. Slide 30, ventilation fans. Um, one of those things on an observation that you know, hopefully doesn't become, uh, you know, one that's not operational and doesn't get, you know, overlooked because if they're not operational, uh, we're underventilating more than likely. Uh, if we have those that are, you know, shutters are off, uh, then they become an unintentional inlet. Uh, and so we've compromised their airflow uh, within the building in terms of being uniform and consistent. So next slide is 31, um, inlets. Our goal in terms of airspeed, and, and here we measure in feet per minute, uh, is 800 to 1,000 feet per minute. At that airspeed, we get, you know, the desired air flow, desired air mixing before it gets down to pig level, which becomes really important, especially in the wintertime. The problem with winter is that often it's hard to achieve this 800 feet per minute, and we may end up looking at normal uh, uh, air velocities here somewhat less than that just because of the minimum ventilation, uh, especially when we would have smaller pigs uh, in the barn. And then to have those inlets, even if they're actuated, to make sure that they're calibrated properly uh, and that they're opening and closing to about the right amount um, within the barn. Slide 32 uh, gives us a little bit here on belts. Uh, we're probably uh, some of us may still be using our tunnel, our tunnel fans where we would you know, typically find these, but as those belts where we do get a reduction in fan speed, uh, maybe even up to 20%, which would be like shutting one of those off on a hot day maybe. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, that those are maintained. Uh, and then another uh, use for that infrared thermometer would be to measure uh, the temperature of the pulley. And from the PIC Wean to Finish Manual, it says a pulley that is seven degrees warmer than room temperature, uh, the belt is slipping. Uh, and so that's uh, good information. Uh, next slide on manure storage. Um, we have some producers that, that check that you know, storage level uh, pretty frequently and others not so much. Um, but if we have pit fans over those pump outs on the outside, those pit fans uh, need an inlet uh, if they're going to work properly. Um, if we're getting the pit to the full stages, which we might be this time of year, uh, and those pit fans don't have much air space there, uh, inlet space to pull that air from uh, over the top of the, uh, the, the manure in the lagoon, uh, you might as well shut them off because we're going to burn them up. Uh, and, and then another reason to look at manure storage would be the issues of, with foaming, and there's literature out there on foaming as well, and we do get some calls on that. From an equipment standpoint, uh, feeders, feeder adjustments, uh, uh, water uh, is a big one. And we'll talk about those uh, as we go to slide 35. First of all, with feeders, um, you know, you'll have variations here in pig size in terms of uh, if they keep those feeders clean. Uh, sometimes they just they don't know where to lay. Sometimes they don't know where to urinate, and we have those issues. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we need to have a supply of feed for those pigs, and it should be clean and fresh. So we need to make those observations. If we go on here to slide 36, um, proper adjustment. Kansas State's got a lot of good pictures out there on their website. Uh, and I think I, I sourced that on the footnotes on that slide, on this slide. 40% feed coverage of the pan. And you might find a few variations from that. Uh, but in, in this photo, photo, it's, it's, you know, providing a pretty good range here for an ideal uh, feed conversion. And then within the same barn or, or the same genetics, uh, you know, a different, uh, feeder setting here. And we're, uh, you know, we've got a feed conversion ratio of, of 2.6 pounds of feed per pound of gain. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we get into, and we are into, you know, tighter margins with our pigs and, and profits uh, or losses, uh, anything we can save here in terms of feed uh, costs uh, can certainly be beneficial for our bottom line. If we go to slide 38 and we look at water flow rates, uh, and we're all over the board here. From our PQA manual, Table 5.1, we've got some fairly fairly high rates here, in, in our mind anyway, or as, as I visited with Mike Brum on this, um, we've got uh, finish, focus on finisher flow rate here of 17 seconds per pint. And I really don't know where they source that from, but 
most of the literature and recommendations that are out there in terms of fact sheets would say our grower and finisher uh, water flow rate should be in the 30 seconds per pint uh, range. And, and uh, for those of you that are in Canada, you're going to maybe have to do some conversions there, but I, I think you'll find that even your literature would say about the same thing. Uh, and then our line pressure there, uh, somewhere around 20 or a little less. But yet, we want to make sure we've got adequate water going to all the drinkers. And so it's certainly worthwhile checking uh, because if they're not getting enough water, they're not going to eat feed or enough feed. And so it's a, it's a key uh, efficiency and gain factor there within our barns. Next slide then, um, slide 39, the whole thing about wasted water. And I, and I had a visit yesterday quickly here with a production supervisor here in Ohio, and they said that uh, some of their uh, wean to finish barns with wet dry feeders had 120,000 less gallons in the pit than some of their other wean to finish barns with different style uh, feeders and drinkers. And, and so where does the difference come in? Um, I would say it's probably a lot to do with water wastage. Because those pigs in the, in, that are, you know, not producing as much manure and wasted water, they're still growing and performing well. Uh, and so to look at water wastage, I think, is, a, is really key um, because it does, it adds to our pit, it dilutes our manure nutrients, uh, and we haul more gallons. In this, you know, case, 120,000 more gallons uh, when that pit is full. And so uh, Mike Brum uh, kind of had this scenario uh, of just 90 drips per minute, and, and you can multiply that and, and however you want. But I think at, at a, you know, at a penny a gallon uh, to haul that and to get it applied, and you look at 120,000 gallons, right there you're looking at $1,200. And so it's, it's huge uh, and it's real. And I think we need to pay attention to it. Uh, and one of the really neat ways to do that is if you go – Excuse me, not this slide, but but anyway, we'll get to it. Slide 40 <clears throat> is a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, it was a research report from 2012, uh, and it looked at 116 sites uh, with uh, wean finish feeders and uh, wet dry feeders, I should say, and the, the ranges even within those feeders that they had, uh, and then comparing a site here in Ohio where I have eight-year averages, uh, and they had uh, swing nipples. Uh, and, and a few cup waters, uh, and they're right in there uh, in terms of the eight-year average in terms of uh, water consumption and manure slurry volume per pig. So um, moving to the next slide, then, this is the one I was trying to get to uh, in terms of uh, a water meter. And hopefully you've got water meters because they can tell us, um, you know, when we're not, when we don't have pigs in the barn and we're not power washing or disinfecting, we may only have a day or two when we're not having pigs come back in there. But that's an important time to take water meter readings and to see if we've got water leaking somewhere. It'll tell us how many gallons that might be uh, and give us an opportunity to, to search that out and get some repairs made before we bring pigs back in. As we wrap this up on slide 42, um, you know, remember the basics, feed water in a dry place to sleep. We go to slide 43 and I make a few acknowledgments there uh, in terms of uh, some of the resource materials that I had in pictures, and slide 44 uh, brings us to the questions or comments uh, from your end in terms of uh, what uh, what key things you might want to offer up in terms of what you do uh, when you do your walkthroughs and make your observations. Thanks, Dale, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I do want to thank once again Dale Ricker from The Ohio State University for being our speaker today and sharing um, his experiences of doing lots of site assessments as to what we should be looking for in the barns. I'd also like to thank all of you for participating in our Pork Bridge session today. With that, this concludes our session for today. Again, thank you everyone for your participation. <laughs>